turn up the volume and free your mind because this is the Humans 2.0 podcast hosted by Mark Metry. What you feed your mind every day will shape your future. Listening to this podcast will strengthen your mind, thoughts, and beliefs. Leave behind the everyday mundane trivialities of your average human version 1.0 and meta-learn your way into becoming a human version 2.0 with a new upgraded guest in each episode. Enjoy. Jay Hendricks is the author of the New York Times best-selling book, Thank you for arguing what Aristotle, Lincoln, and Homer Simpson can teach us about the art of persuasion. His latest book is How to Argue with a Cat, a Human's Guide to Persuasion. He's also a professor of the practice of rhetoric and oratory at Middlebury College. Jay's also a consultant for clients ranging from NASA, Southwest Airlines, and Wharton School of business. You guys don't want to miss this one. I learned such an unbelievable amount of practical information that I can start applying right now in just my 45 minute conversation with Jay. And as always, if you enjoyed this, please go on iTunes and leave me a review because it helps the show grow even more. Enjoy. Welcome back to the Humans 2.0 podcast. This is your host, Mark Metry. Today I'm joined by Jay. Jay, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Mark. How are you? I couldn't be better. Thank you so much for being here. Jay, how do you spend your time here on planet Earth? Oh, man, I could tell you how I'd like to spend time on planet Earth, but we can't all get what we want. I travel way too much, but when I'm at home, I live on 150 acres at the base of a mountain, which is where I am right now. So I get up at 430 in the morning, do my stupid workout. and then I get to do pretty much whatever I want, which most of the time I spend writing. So there's no there's no more fun day than when I'm at home and doing this. I love it, man. That's a real author. Um, so Jay, I you know I usually like to ask my guests how they got down their path. I know you have a couple books out. Um, I know you're also a professor, but how did you get started with the path of rhetoric and really how humans interact with one another you know i that's a great question mark i for all my life i've loved to read but even as a kid i wondered whether words would do something more than just sit around looking pretty i I wondered if they ever got up and made a living for themselves (laughs) and so uh i had never heard of rhetoric which is now the fastest growing subject in higher education it's blowing up in schools high schools i'm happy to say i didn't know any of that so it wasn't until i was about i don't know 32 and i was working at dartmouth college here in new hampshire and i was bored in my job um so i would spend all this time in the the open stacks of the library. And one day I came to this part of the library where the like fluorescent bulbs had been burned out and there were cobwebs all over the <laughs> books. And one book that was colored red, like red leather among all these gray, dusty books. And I pulled it down and I'm kind of a history buff. So I opened it up and was delighted to see that it had been signed by John Quincy Adams, you know, mm-hmm. president of the United States. So it turns out he had given a series of lectures when he was 38 years old and a United States Senator to Harvard, to these freshmen at Harvard, like future masters of the universe. And he told them in the first lecture to take from the relics of ancient oratory, these unresisted powers, which mold the mind of man to the will of the speaker and yield the guidance of the nation to the dominion of the voice. You can tell I've said that before, right? (laughs) So I thought, this is it. This is words making a living for themselves. And so his lectures essentially were a kind of syllabus of books I should read. So I did that for the next 10 years. I drove my family crazy. (laughs) I I interviewed rhetoricians around the world. Uh, Rhetoric being this 3,000-year-old discipline that that, that teaches leadership, that gets people to make choices together, that brings societies together and help create civilizations. You can't beat it. So uh, my wife finally said after years and years, 
you know, why don't you get this stuff out of your system and write a book about it? And she's a very smart woman, so I do everything she tells me to do. That was the dumbest thing she's ever said to me. <laughs> did not get rhetoric out of my system. I'm still passionate about it. That's that's awesome. Um, so yeah, so so you decided to write the book after your your wife gave you that that little hint. So what you know through writing all of your books, what have you found to be the most important points to um, take across to somebody else's mind that you know somebody that's maybe never been aware, consciously aware of rhetoric, what would you kind of begin this conversation with? Well, the first thing I would say, and I, actually I got two big tools from Aristotle, the mm. philosopher who wrote the book on rhetoric. It's probably the last book he wrote. So it was like the summary of all he'd learned. And this guy was pretty smart. Um, he personally tutored Alexander the Great, who not only was a terrific warrior, but also helped create Hellenism, which was the spread of this Western civilization around the known world at the time. So there's a lot of rhetoric behind all this. Aristotle said two, basically two things. First, here, here the guy was who invented logic as we know it today. And he said, because of our sorry human nature, that's how he put it, <laughs> um, logic is not the most persuasive tool. He said that ethos is, and by ethos he meant what people think of you, what your character is to other people, whether you're likable and trustworthy. If people trust you, they're gonna believe you whether your facts are all wrong um, and whether you're speaking entirely illogically. Okay, so that's one tool. It's like the first thing you wanna do before you persuade people is to make them feel that you're part of the tribe maybe, or that you're a leader, or that at least you can be trusted. All right, second tool, and this is what people really walk away from because it's the easiest uh, walk away with, I should say, because it's the easiest thing to, to learn. When you're in any kind of disagreement and people start getting a little pissed off at each other, um, think about what tense you're in. You know, you know from your grammar, you got past tense. Well, that's where bad things happened in the past. You know, that's why you should lock up Hillary, you know, because of all her <laughs> crimes she committed. Um, you could talk about the present, which has to do with values, what's good and bad, you know, who's good and who's bad, who's in and out of the tribe. Mm -hmm. Or, and this is what you should do, you can switch to the future. You can say, look, you can call me a jerk. You can blame me for anything. But how's that going to fix things? Let's talk about how to fix. So my son, George, when he was 15, he grew up hearing me lecture constantly at the dinner table about this stuff. And he was kind of a wise ass, still is. Um, he, so at one point I found myself alone in the bathroom, uh, with a tube of toothpaste that had been squeezed entirely dry and being the father of a 15 year old son, I knew who the likely culprit was. So I shout through this closed door, George, who used up all the toothpaste? And I hear this sarcastic voice on the other side saying, that's not the point, is it dad? The point is, how are we going to keep this from happening again? <laughs> and, you know, I had told him, like, when you're in trouble, the be best way to get out of it is to switch to the future test. Now, he was making fun of me. He's being sarcastic. But, you know, and I'm about to bring up a third amazing tool of persuasion. I said to him, I was so pleased that he actually had been listening to me, although he hadn't seemed to be paying any attention all this time, these years. I said, all right, George, you win. Now, will you please get me some toothpaste? And you know what? He did. He went down to our freezing basement here in New Hampshire, and he got me a tube. So to this day, he says he won the argument, and he mm -hmm. kind of did on points. But I got a teenager to run an errand happily for me. So, And this is the ideal of rhetoric, of the art of argument, which is that if both sides think they've won and nobody's angry, nobody gets shot, I mean, that is a total win, win-win. He is now teaches. And so he teaches mm. history, but he also teaches uh, debate and rhetoric uh, in Seattle. And he's an amazing teacher. He's one of these teachers that you're like a little afraid of, but it make you laugh at the same time. I would <laughs> find him terrifying. I'm glad he's not my teacher. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, what? all the points you touched on are really, really interesting. And I, you know the pieces in my mind started to, you know, collect together when 
I've had on this body language and human behavior expert on this podcast. And he told me that within the first three seconds, and it doesn't even matter if you talk or not, the other person's brain has already grouped you into a category. And, you know, watching TED Talk after TED Talk, it's become really apparent to me that, you know, people are kind of leveraging these tools in speech to effectively communicate their point across, right? Because we've all been there listening to a speech where like the dude has obviously had no training. He's awful. He's not relatable. He's not in the tribe. Uh, he's not, you know, and even if the information that he's giving is beneficial, nobody's even listening, which is why I think, you know, the the rhetoric and, you know, how you conduct yourself in the way that you said is unbelievably important if you want to do anything with people these days. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. So, um, and, and this is, so my first book that I wrote on rhetoric uh, um, w is called Thank You for Arguing. And what that does is it conveys a certain attitude toward disagreement, that disagreement is a good thing. We need to do that. This is how we make choices together is by airing our disagreements. The thank you part is, you know, how to practice good decorum with people. So the book, my most recent book, How to Argue with a Cat, mm -hmm. um, th the reason why I mention that is that you just brought up a really important principle of rhetoric, which is a lot of people get hung up on what words to use. What are the perfect words, you know, to, to use to get laid or to get a job, <laughs> you know, or to get out of trouble or whatever. And um, what... What I say is, you know, don't worry first about the words because those three seconds really are a real thing. The first thing you need to do is to establish your ethos in front of your audience, the character that you express to them. And, you know, I'll tell you, I'm 63 years old. I'm a white male. <laughs> this is not a good time in much of society to be a 63 year old white male. People are ready to hate me, you know, when I go in front of audiences. So I can't simply you know, say, hey, trust me, I'm an old guy. I know a lot, you know. Instead, I have to, in that first moment, make them know that I'm delighted with them and there's reasons for them to be delighted with me. And this is where cats come in, believe it or not. First of all, cats don't have a very large vocabulary. They're not hung up on words, and yet they can persuade us to do anything. Mm -hmm. One of the things they can do is that Cats, partly because they have a number of very tiny muscles around their eyes can, and don't have any other muscles in their face, essentially, can express a lot just through their eyes. And one of the greatest rhetoricians of all time, Marcus Tullius Cicero from ancient Rome, said that the eyes are the windows to the soul. So one of the things that I do, and I teach people, I, I actually, I'm a consultant. Uh, that's how I make my actual money. There aren't books don't do it for me. Um, I, I teach uh, corporate types to give presentations, persuasive presentations. And a lot of them are really terrified. Like, what are the perfect words to use? You know, what if this is really mean and nasty audience? And I say, before you go on, and this is what a cat will do if it's ready to love you, send love beams out of your eyes. As stupid as that sounds, it totally works. So by the way, Mark, I did that with you. Uh, before I clicked into this Google Hangout, I said, uh, "I'm I love this guy, you know." And I knew I would, and I and I do. Um, but in increasingly, I also talk to uh, I do Skype ins with high school classes a couple times a week. If you adopt my nice. book, you know, I'll I'll do this thing for free. Partly because I just so admire what these teachers are doing in public schools, but also because it's a great way to interact with the students and see what they think. But before I do it, I send love beams out of my eyes because who am I? I am this old guy. I'm sometimes described as kind of scary because I have this like hawk-like face. And when I get intense and really interested in what I'm saying, I scare people. Uh, and so if I just make sure that my eyes are doing it all and I, like, I'm in love with the subject and the people I'm speaking with, that is actually, you know, d the word decorum means fitness in Latin. Fitness as in, you know, fitting in with your environment. And cats fit into every environment brilliantly. They can squeeze into any box on earth regardless of the size. We need to do that socially. 
And the best way to do that is to show the love. And that's true even if you fundamentally disagree with the other person, if you think they stand for things that are evil, the thing is you're, you're not going to convince that person to turn around 180 degrees, but you can at least establish a relationship by showing the love from human to human or mm -hmm. cat to human. I, I, love, I, I love that, that, so, that much. so much. And I think, I think the, the genuine, genuine intent, intent comes, comes across, across most, most times. times. One of my One favorite of my people, Joe Rogan, he, uh, he has this concept and it's, it's really changed the way I see people. And he says that when he's growing up, he used to see people, whether it was on the street or his teacher, as like static characters. Like you're you're a 60-year-old white dude and you've always been there. But he said after he had kids, he realized the progression from baby to adult. And he just views everyone as a baby because we were all once babies. <laughs> and that kind of like connects that that across. And it's super powerful. I try to do the same thing on my podcast. I try to, you know, before I go on, I try to imagine like I'm in a stadium and I'm like imagining a thousand people listening to this. You know, it, it, it's, I think it might be a little bit different, but it's still, it ensures that I authentically communicate what I have and I don't take any shortcomings because of our our brain's ability to navigate the the psychosocial landscape that we have today, so to speak. Yeah, you know, at the same time, it's really, you know, we're shifting a little bit here into those thousand people. It's really important for you to know who they are, you know, mm -hmm. understand their beliefs and their expectations. So a, a few weeks ago, I found myself on the stage of the London Palladium, this beautiful sort of opera house, classic place where all the great actors have appeared. And I was appearing with a group of, of authors I really um, uh, um, admired. I was, you know, kind of intimidated by them, in fact, in a green room, you know, all these amazing people. Uh, and most of them were being interviewed on stage by this famous BBC presenter. I was supposed to be like comic relief in between. Nobody interviewed me. They just shoved me onto the stage and said, do your thing, you know, talk about your cat book. Um, so I got a thousand people at the London Palladium, and there was a, like a hundred thousand people online listening in. This is, by the way, you can see the video of this, and you can see how mortified I am just doing this. But I got a large number of them to lick each other on the backs of their necks. Now, why did I do? That? Why did I do that? And I think this is like my career has stooped as far as it will ever go when I did that. This is not like great literature. What, the reason I did that was that I knew that um, British people think the height of humor is makes them feel uncomfortable. Like when they're their most uncomfortable, they're laughing, laughing the loudest. I thought, all right, how do I make them as uncomfortable as possible? First, I got them to purr like cats because purring is a very important principle of rhetoric. It makes you, you're showing that you appreciate the other person, but it's also a way to coax them to do more like scratch my neck, you know, I'm gonna purr louder because you're doing this right. I'm gonna purr a little softer when you're doing it in the wrong place. Rather than criticizing your purring, I got them to do that. I literally got them to purr. Then I, I got them to sniff each other because the really important thing is to know what characteristics you have in common. And so cats do it with smell. And then I and then I told them to lick each other on the backs of their necks. And I'll, it was the biggest laugh I've ever gotten. It was this great triumph. And at the same time, I thought I'm spending another eon in purgatory just for doing this. <laughs> but what I did was I started with their beliefs and expectations and who they were. They're very different from me. I, you know, I'm an American. You make me uncomfortable. I'm not going to laugh. Like I'm going to walk away. Um, but Brits love it. Give me more. Make me uncomfortable. And that's what I started with. And I, I think that that's, again, you walk in for those first three seconds. And in some cultures, you establish the eye contact, you've lost all communication, right? You, mm -hmm. you can honor a person more by not looking in their eyes. In America, if you don't establish that eye contact, you've immediately lost them. Mm -hmm. That's a real That's interesting, a real interesting point. And, and 
you know, now yeah, that now I'm that thinking I'm... about it, now that it's kind of synced in, what you said about before joining this call about, you know, you you loving me and having that intention, you know, I can, you know, I've learned so much from this podcast and all the amazing guests that I talk to. And I have a feeling, you know, three months from now, that's something that's that's going to sink in in a more uh, important way than it has. And um, I want to ask you this, this is going to be an extremely open ended question. But so you've already shared that. But how else have you taken all of these different elements, all these different elements that you reverted out in your book and your in your speaking? How do you apply them in your own life? You mentioned one, but I, I want to hear some more because uh, you you definitely know what you're talking about. Yeah, you know, I I talk about a rhetorical frame of mind. You live with these tools long enough, and you realize they all kind of come together in a sort of synthesis. Mm. And that synthesis comes down to this, and and even a six year old can learn this. It's not about you. <laughs> so rhetoric is not about what you want. It's what Aristotle called the advantageous. It's what's to the advantage of your audience. You want them to make a choice that you want. You have to explain why it's good for them, not why you really want it really, really badly. Um, so at the same time, you know, it's not about you also means that it's about not just who your audience is, and that audience can be one person or it can be a thousand people. It's also who's the persuadable audience. So if you are in a face-to-face -face confrontation, let's say it's at Thanksgiving dinner and the inevitable uncle is lecturing you on how to make America great again or whatever, <laughs> um, you know, you can have an argument with that person. Are you going to persuade that person at all? Probably not. I mean, you can confuse them a little bit, and maybe we can get to that later because there are awesome tools for confusing an extremist. But, mm. but you know, you also have to think, okay, who else is there around the dinner table? And how can I make this at least a more pleasant occasion for them? And maybe even get them to see my point of view better, possibly even change a mind or two if they're persuadable. Now, so all this adds up to one basic thing, which is that Rhetoric is the ultimate outward facing discipline. It's not speaking truth to power. It is tapping into the beliefs and expectations of your audience and seeing if you can bring as large a group together to make a decision in common, hopefully one that you would like. Um, that's where the best politics begin and end. It's where you know civilizations get built and where companies get formed. But until you do that, you're going to be trapped inside yourself. And so all these tools add up to that one thing. It's it's mm -hmm. my, you know, and I, I'll tell you, I'm an introvert, um, off the charts introvert. So one of the reasons why I was so interested in rhetoric is that I wanted to learn ways that I could get along with people. I was already getting into management um, and finding I was doing it really badly because I was inside myself. And rhetoric has allowed me to, to face other people and to engage with them in ways that force me to try to understand them better. And it's done a world of good for me. And I think that especially, you know, rhetoric tends to be studied more by extroverts who are already good at it. It's really more for the introverts like me. Hmm. That's awesome. I can totally relate to that. I, uh, I'm, I'm definitely an introvert too, but it, I guess it depends on the situation. But, uh, you know, learning body language, studying a little bit of rhetoric, how to communicate, how to pronounce has really showed me the way and really done the same thing for me. Um, Jay, are there any, are there any things that you apply when you're doing virtual chats aside from the 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 loving intention at first or um you know when you're giving your talks you know you're doing them in person but they're also going to be seen online do you give any consideration to that yeah you know you mentioned the word authentic earlier and that's really hard and you know when you think about this what you and I are doing right now is a performance. And so there's a there's already a little bit of artificiality to it. Um, so and it's harder for me as well, because, you know, again, I'm an old guy. Um, now, you can say I can be the cranky old guy who just says whatever the hell he wants. And, you know, regardless of the consequences. 
Or, you know, I can, on the other hand, if I try to use humor, the humor can be off base and um, I can offend people. Um, or on the other hand, I can seem too slick. I mean, one of the problems that I have in everything I do is that people expect me to be like persuasion boy, you know, like <laughs> because I study this stuff, I must be the most persuasive person on earth. And I can tell you, my own family will tell you that I'm, you know, I fail more than I'd succeed. Um, you know, I think the important thing here is when you are thinking that this stuff is going to, first of all, expand to a larger audience, you know, be very careful not to get too tribal. In other words, don't be too insiderish um, with your terminology, with your politics, with the jokes you tell. Um, I've become much more sensitive about, uh, you know, is not showing myself to be a sexist yeah. um, or trying to talk too much about gender differences, which used to be a marvelous source of humor <laughs> for hundreds of years. You know, the other thing is too, there are two things to worry about. One is the size of your audience and an unintended audience can be a terrible thing. So mm -hmm. you, I, I know a guy once who uh, was working at a startup company and that had a PA system that allowed whoever was, you know, on your phone, you could just tap into the speakers all through this large uh, office and not knowing that he'd hit the wrong button on his phone. This is back when everybody had these sort of console phones. Uh, he started talking about the magnificent breasts of a young woman who had just uh, started work there. And it was broadcast over the entire company. Now, I use that as an example. First of all, the guy should never have been doing this in the first place. He should have known better. This is not good decorum under any circumstances at all. It's just bad. On top of that, you know, maybe it would have worked fine for the sexist guy he was talking to in the room, but his audience expanded beyond that. In this day of social media, you have no idea how far your audiences are going to go. And so you can pick up any tweet that Donald Trump wrote two years ago and make it absolutely contra contradict his latest tweet. So that's one thing. The other thing is, that's audience, but the other thing is time. What you say may live forever. You know, it could, it could last for years. And so what you say now may not come off so well later on. And so those two things are to worry about. Exp you know, your words are gonna expand beyond what you think they are, regardless of whom you're talking to and how. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Those are, those, those are awesome points. Um, you know, speaking of the internet, um, and maybe just in, in general, how do you, or, or maybe should you, should you have that conversation with, you know, let's say it is your uncle on Thanksgiving day that, you know, you know, he is like super, 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 super solid in his views. And you may think they're wrong. How do you, should, should you go about that conversation? How do you maybe disarm that? Is that, is that even a good idea in the first place? Yeah. Thanks for that follow-up. <laughs> so there are several goals that uh, rhetoric describes for any kind of argument. The first is to change the mood of your audience. And that's the easiest to do. So with this crazy uncle, you could put him in a better mood. I mean, alcohol always helps. Well, not always. <laughs> it can actually make the guy <laughs> work, but and probably he's drinking already. So let's skip that part. The second thing is uh, to change the person's mind. And that's much harder. And in this case, you're probably not going to. The third is to get someone to do something or stop doing it. And you can get your uncle to shut up, but that can be hard as well. All right, so there's a fourth goal that I personally described, describe, and that's relationship. So you can think, okay, I'm not gonna improve the mood very much because everybody's staring at the both of us and wishing we'd both shut up. Um, the second thing, you know, mine, I'm not gonna change this person's mind and nobody, people just wanna eat their turkey, you know, and have a nice time with the family. So I'm not gonna try to change people's minds. Getting this, this guy to shut up, maybe I can try. 
But, you know, maybe the most important thing here is to make my uncle walk away not wanting to kill me with his assault rifle he's just gotten, you know, for himself for Christmas. You know, I mean, maybe that's the best thing of all. And and the thing about, uh, you know, persuasion in general is people think that arguments take place, you know, at one time for five minutes, you change a person's mind, you get them to vote the way you want. Good. Let's do it. You know, that never happens, as you know. So you think about this, maybe over the next six months, this is like dieting and fitness, you know, patience wins all the time. So if you try to push too hard, you're going to have the opposite effect. And by the way, research shows this really clearly. If you start bringing up facts and you're getting really logical, facts will push people into a more extreme position. The mm -hmm. best thing to do is work first on the relationship. Honor the other person. I mean, that uncle may have worked very hard for a living. That uncle may find that his power is being diminished. He's, he's getting more and more ignored by people. He no longer has the sexual prowess maybe he used to have. He's invisible to society, which women find they are at 40. You know, he's discovering at 60 that he's invisible. By the way, I'm not speaking personally here. I'm not going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's what you find with a lot of people like crazy uncles at Thanksgiving is a lot of pain, you know, mm. and if you can sort of tap into that a little bit and say, I hear you, you know, I understand you're not honored the way maybe you should be. Let's talk about that. Let's not talk necessarily about why it's important to separate babies from mothers, you know, who cross the border asking for asylum. Maybe we should be talking instead about what changes you're seeing and why that it, that's hurtful to, for you. You may walk away with a great relationship with the guy without changing his mind at all, but over time you can do even better. So if, if you don't mind my continuing into part two here, we talked a little bit earlier about confusing people. Mm -hmm. So, all right, you don't wanna love this guy. He's just an asshole. Um, so there's, you don't want to honor him at all. That demeans you when you do that. Okay. So it's time to bring out a little bit of artillery here. Uh, what you can do is what I call aggressive interest. So remember, there are other people around the table. You don't want to be the jerk. You know, you want to keep him in the jerk role at Thanksgiving. So what you, can, what you do instead is you ask for three things. First, you ask for definitions. What do you mean by? Mm. So what do you mean by an illegal? Describe it. So it's a person who felt to fill out the right forms before coming in. Is that what you mean? Or, you know, how exactly did they break the law? And is that the equivalent of driving five miles an hour over the speed limit? Like, what's the difference here? Is, is it paperwork or is it something else? I don't really understand. The second thing you ask for is facts. All right, so how many immigrants are there coming in the country? Are they increasing? Are they decreasing? Where are they from exactly? And what you're gonna find is that this guy is like in the back, he's gonna look really confident, but in the back of the mind, his mind, he's thinking, I didn't do my research for this. <laughs> exactly, all right. And then finally you ask for sources. Okay, I've heard about Breitbart. Like what, do you, what is Breitbart? Who funds that thing? Like, you know, where's it coming from? And what kind of fact checkers do they have there? And, and again, you're going to find, you know, the person may push back and he can say, why, what are your fake news sources? You tell me. And you can say, oh, a lot of, a lot of source, lots and lots. But I'm interested in yours because I want to learn more. And you keep doing that. So you see what you're doing. It's clearly fake. You know, and people can see right through it. And people may be smiling at you. You have to, you have to look sincere. That's really hard. But you may actually find yourself learning stuff. It, it's possible. The most important of those three things is the first, definitions. What do you mean by it? When someone mm -hmm. uses the word freedom, you know, that is like, what the hell does freedom mean? Does it mean restricting other people so other people can be free? Can it, does it mean like everybody does whatever the hell they want? That's a really interesting, right? So uh, jobs is another great thing. You hear it both on the left and the right. We should have guaranteed jobs. What is a job? Very few people can define it. Um, so almost all conversations start out with very poorly, uh, poor definitions for the terms they're using. 
if you just want to stick, uh, put a stick in the bicycle spokes of whoever is talking and make them just do an endo, logically, ask for definitions. It'll drive them crazy. And you'll find themselves, what will happen, and research backs this up, you'll find people actually moderating their stance. Maybe not their opinions in the long run, but you'll find them saying, okay, I don't mean all immigrants. You know, maybe immigrants are a good thing. Oh, yes, my ancestors were immigrants. You know, you can find them backing away mm -hmm. from these extremist positions. You know, I mean, maybe Hillary shouldn't be locked up, but those emails, man, those emails, whatever they were, and I don't really remember what they were about, but they were really bad. You know, that's a moderation. And you'll find that eventually everybody gets bored with a conversation and you eat your, your turkey stuffing and everybody's happy. Man, Man, I love us so, so much. much. Definitions, Definitions, asking them for that is, is, is so, so, so important. important. You know, you based on my experience, I've found that, that when I do do that, when I do ask for definitions, they'll either give me like some mumbo jumbo that they're like conjuring up in the second. And like, I can kind of see it in their eyes. They themselves don't know. And they're like, wait, how did, how did that idea even get there? And like, they kind of start backtracking and depending on how open-minded the individual is and how I conduct the conversation, I'll get like a text message like six months from later and they'll be like, dude, you were telling me this and I was saying that and you were totally right. And like what I try to do, what I found is really important and you, I think this is the entire thing is I try to like cross arbitrage a common ground for for the relationships like my end goal is to still be friends with this person and actually genuinely care about them just like the whole baby analogy that we mentioned before this person has had things that have happened to them just like you said there's often deep-seated pain and if i can arbitrage and say hey we may not agree with this but you know, we both care about this thing, then we can kind of find that common ground. And what I found when I do that is they're much, they're not as hostile, they're much more open. And eventually they start questioning it in their mind and it leads, you know, down the road. It's kind of like um, planting seeds if you, if you do it well enough. Yeah. You actually bring up a really important, cool, I'm going to get totally rhetoric nerd on you for this. Yeah. You know, the word topic is it comes from the greek topos which means place so if you know you know topology is the study of surfaces um topographic maps mm. have to do mm. with you know the shapes of land mm. um so why is topic related to this it's because um the way the greeks thought was ideas had places mm. so uh, in fact, you know, you've heard of the memory palace. This is related mm -hmm. to topics theory. So the memory palace is where, and, and Greeks and Romans did this, even at childhood, and they would practice it throughout their lives. You would create this palace. I actually describe it more as a shopping mall because we're like Americans and it's easier to figure this out. But what they would do is they would place topics and figures of speech and facts and things like that in separate rooms. And when they were ready to give an oration, this is in ancient Greeks, by, by the way, orations were like four to eight minutes long. They weren't two to three hours. And plus, Greek audiences to this day are the worst in the world. They're like, every one of them is a heckler. The mm -hmm. hoi polloi were the people, you know, the commoners sitting down there and they would throw things and scream. So what would happen is you may have a memorized speech. You're going to throw it away because you're gonna have to be responding to hecklers all the time, constant challenges. So what they would do is, instead of memorizing a speech, they would think about what route they were gonna take through their memory palace, which rooms they were gonna visit for ideas and expressions and figures and the ways they were gonna say things. And what would happen was when they were interrupted, they would simply change the route. And now this took years of practice, but to this day, neurologists have said that, you know, having, this is a wonderful memorization technique, a, a placing things with memorable objects. I won't get into details about that, you know. All right, so back to topic theory here. The commonplace, you know that term commonplace, which often means cliche now. Hmm. Commonplaces were beliefs and expectations that your audience have has in common. 
So when you talk about arbitrage of ideas, that's really what you're tapping right into this ancient notion of the commonplace, which is like the central park of beliefs and ideas. And that's what you start with when you're trying to convince your audience, you know? So you are sussing out what the beliefs of the other person is. You know, you may be very far apart in what you're talking about, but you may find that there are some things you do have in common and that's what you're going to work on. They can be values as well. One of the things I'm saying these days, this is, you know, we're doing this on 4th of July week. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, this is at a time where somehow even the American flag is divisive to us. Like, well, that would never happen. Yeah, so yeah. I'm saying to people on the left, bring out your flags, show them like outdo everybody on the right, show more flags than they do, raise them higher, buy bigger ones, you know? So in our little tiny town here in New Hampshire, it's fewer than 300 people. And the town, by the way, went for Obama in the previous election, went for Trump in this one. It's one of those towns where people kind of feel left out and want, want to change. Mm -hmm. My wife and I bought one of the flags you can buy that were flown over the Capitol building. And we mm -hmm. presented that. And so every time there's a town meeting, we all pledge allegiance to the flag. And we are probably the left of most of the people in our town. I mean, I'm a moderate and an independent, but that still puts me the left of most of the people in the town. Um, we proudly put our hands over our hearts and pledge allegiance to the flag we gave the town that flew over the Capitol. And, you know, I'm proud to do it. And everybody looks at me like, wow, that lefty has some good values. And all kinds of things start from there. That's the commonplace. Jay, Jay, thank you so thank much you. for coming on the podcast. Where can people go to, to learn more about yourself and check out the rest of your work? You go to jay at jayheinrichs.com and you can find all kinds of cool stuff. Um, or just look me up. I'm on all the finer social media. Awesome. Jay, I usually like to ask my, my, my guests to ask the audience a self-inquisitive question because I found that, you know, these, these kind of introspective questions can be really powerful tools. Um, but before that, you know, I just want to say, Jay, this, uh, this podcast is called Humans 2.0. And I've got to acknowledge you for all of the work, you know, just sitting here for the last 40 minutes, I've learned a lot. And I'm sure this is going to be one of those podcasts where I listen to you over and over again, and I get a different thing out of that. So thank you for that. And I'd love if you could ask my audience a question. What can you love in your audience? That's, you know, by audience, we have to define it. It's anyone yeah. you're talking to. What can you love in them? Everything comes from that. I love it. Jay, thank you so much for coming on the Humans 2.0 podcast. And thank you everyone out there for listening. This has been your host, Mark Metric. Thank you for listening to the Humans 2.0 podcast. There are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there and you chose to listen to this. Please subscribe, share, and tell a friend about Humans 2.0 so they can improve as well. If you loved listening to that, I would love your feedback whether you're watching this on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, and anything else. Keep learning on the Humans 2.0 podcast.